Um, did somebody copy down the equations from lab discussion? There are four equations. What, what video did you see was on the um, with the one equation or? Monday or Wednesday? This is just the graphing part. I didn't do the equations on, on this day. I'll check on Wednesday. a long time. That's why I don't want to have, um, go through the whole thing. Uh, I just want to um, take a look at the equation. Then you can see the derivation. So that was um, This is the Baron Stall phase. That was what, Monday? What's that? Did you cover one of the labs? Yeah. She's missing um, the equations. Here they are. These are the equations here. See, um, see this video was on. Um, Wednesday, week nine. I did all the I did all the equations, so if I'm going to do them again, it would just take too much time. You can just watch this video, including all of them. I did all of them, and uh, I spent like an hour, I think, or close to an hour, something like that. And so I, I don't, I can't really spend another hour. Okay. But I am going to spend. 15 minutes on it because I'll do the um, 
to do one of them now. Um, but yeah, look at Wednesday week nine. That's actually, what you want to do is you don't want to just copy down the equation and then just plug in the number. The ideal situation would be if you could drive the equation. Um, you know, this is the equation here. This is what? This is the hot water, cold water. We went through the derivation of this. Then this is the HCl and the sodium hydroxide here. And so you, what you want to do is you want to go through and, and try to derive the equation yourself, which is a good thing to do. I'm sorry? The amounts are going to be different because it, it depends on the amount you got from the stock room. This one, the amounts are going to be the same, basically, because these are just the stock solutions. Everybody has the same stock solution. Not everybody had the same amount of blood sodium hydroxide. So I, it's hard to read here, but this is the equation for the HCl sodium hydroxide solution, stock solution. Or actually, they're not totally, I mean, they're a little bit more precise. This is the solid sodium hydroxide. This is the equation for the solid sodium hydroxide in water. Okay. I mean, I spent almost an hour, 55 minutes and 32 seconds going through all the equations on this day. Um, so again, it'd be best if you could derive the equations yourself. Well, that would be the most useful. And then finally, the this last equation here. Yeah, it's Q system is equal to minus Q in counting. It's basically a, all, all the problems, the calorimetry problems are all like that. That way, if you, you know, if you go, if you go through and master these equations, mastering these equations is like, you know, when you're practicing, Let's say you're practicing. A lot of people hate practicing. They hate practicing things. Like, you know, they pick up an instrument, their parents want them to play, and they're sick of, of practicing instruments or whatever, you know. But it's, it's pretty important. Otherwise, you know, and so the first thing is, if you don't understand how this is, then you just kind of copy it down and, and then try to um, do the calculation and then you go back to it and you start looking at it in a little bit more deeper. And so each time you go back through this calculation, you know, it's a repetition. So, you, so if it doesn't make any sense at all, the calculation, then do it over and over and over again. You start to do it over and over again, then certain things start to make sense, other things take more time. But eventually, after doing it so many times, like the 50th time you do the calculation, then you start to notice other things. Um, that's, that can be the case. Um, and so what you want to do is you want to start to notice other things between the calculations. What makes this first calculation different than the second calculation, you know? And is it different than the third calculation? And so you want to start to see those kinds of things. Um, and then why, uh, in the first calculation, why did we um, keep them separate, you know? Isn't 50 milliliters plus 50 milliliters 100 milliliters? Why did we keep them separate? But in the third calculation, why did we add them? Those are the types of things you notice after you do it so many times. Um, but initially, it might be pretty confusing. You know, did you notice that? Did you guys already do this calculation? And so a lot of mistakes. When I grade the test, I see, why did you add them together? We got 100 milliliters. It doesn't make any sense. And then why didn't you add them together to get 100 milliliters? You know, because in certain cases, you have to add them together. In other cases, you keep them separate. You have to recognize when that happens. Because I see it. I see mistakes all the time on tests. And I think, okay, they just don't. You know, they haven't seen it enough. They haven't, um, you know. And it's confusing initially, but once you, once you see it, then you go, oh, yeah. Yeah, I definitely don't want to add them together here. 
Yeah. And so, um, yeah. the same thing with multiple choice. You know, with multiple choice, um, you know, the more you, you practice these multiple choice questions, the better you get. And the more variety you see, the better you get. And multiple choice um, questions can be tricky, um, really tricky. And so it's good to expose yourself to a lot of multiple choice. And so I have multiple choice from the last test. This is golden exam two. There's some chapter seven material here, but you want to go through those. And then I posted um, old exam three. There's some multiple, more multiple choice there. And then online, you know, there's these Quizlet things and a whole bunch of other multiple choice um, tests that you can do online <coughs> um, to get more practice with those. And that's helpful. But sometimes multiple choice uh, questions depend on the author because certain authors uh, will emphasize different things. Well, anyway, let's take a look at some of the. Um, the total energy of 50 milliliters of water at 298 Kelvin is the sum of its potential and kinetic energy. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's over and over again. Now, I don't know how many times I've said this. I, I repeat things a lot. How many times have I said the total energy is the sum of the potential and kinetic energy? And that's for anything. It doesn't have to be water. It's for everything. And so I think that the best way for preparing for the test, and the test is when? A week from tomorrow. The test is next week. Okay. The test is going to cover chapter seven. Chapter seven is on the easy chapter. And chapter eight, maybe some of chapter nine. We'll see. But I think the best way for studying this is, you know, if you've heard me say this a million times, you know, total, and if you read it a million times, then it should be pretty familiar. Total energy is the sum of and kinetic energy. So I think the best way to study and prepare for a test, and this goes for any class that I have taken, is to study from notes. You know? If you don't take notes, and a lot of people, for some reason or other, they don't want to take um, notes or they don't take notes. You know, the other thing is that a lot of people will read the book and then just uh, write their own notes from the book. You don't want to have to study from the book because it's too long. It takes too much time. And so either study from notes you take from the book or notes from class. I think notes from class are better because look, I mean the person writing the test is the, uh, usually the lecturer. But anyway, um, the next thing after notes, then I would make sure that you could do every single problem we covered in class. Can you do every single problem we covered in class? It should be easy, because if it's not, then you'd want to keep drilling yourself over and over again until it starts to make sense. It's not, it's not that you want to memorize a certain procedure, okay, you know, do step one, step two. You, you want to see, you know, you want to see a lot of variety so you can have different approaches and problems. But the first step is just to memorize the problems that we've done in class, at least memorize how to do them, so that if anything similar shows up on the test, we are able to do it. Okay, so make sure you understand everything in the notes, and then you can do all the problems. And when I say do all the problems, you should be able to close your notebook and, and be able to do the problems without looking. The next thing you do is uh, go through the homework, and uh, make sure you understand the homework. And there, I, I don't, you usually don't, I'll go through it once, and then I'll just review it. And when I review it, I just kind of skim through it. When I skim through it, I have little mental notes, you know, okay, for this part of them, what do you do? Or I'll just write it down in the book as an annotation. Or in my homework notebook. Okay, then after that, you can look for different sources. You know, online, there are multiple choice questions and um, other books and fun stuff. Okay, there are two types of closed systems, constant volume and constant pressure. 
constant B and constant P. Is that true or false? This question isn't that fair because I skipped this when I was um, lecturing. Sometimes you'll have that. You know, sometimes there'll be stuff in the book, from the book, that the instructor never talked about that we'll throw on the test. This has been an example of that. I usually don't like to do that. I usually like to tell you. But we have these systems. One system is called an open system. And an open system can exchange matter, like water vapor can escape or chemicals can come in and energy with the surroundings. A closed system cannot exchange matter, so all the matter, all the atoms here are stuck inside the glass. So no, no atoms can escape. And likewise, no atoms can enter, you know, or molecules, or whatever. And so this closed, it's closed, so there's no material or matter transport back and forth. However, there's energy, and so it's closed in the sense that matter can't. And that's the definition of a closed system. But, what you don't see in this figure is that there are two kinds of closed systems. There's a rigid container closed system, and the other type of closed system that is commonly drawn is a container like this with a movable lid. And so it's sealed well enough that matter or atoms can't escape or enter into the container. However, um, since the volume can expand or contract, you know, it doesn't have fixed volume. So the volume can expand or contract. Why? Well, if gas is generated here, let's say we're generating steam, we want the volume to expand to maintain constant pressure. Or if the steam condenses, then we want the volume to contract so we can maintain constant pressure. So this is a constant pressure closed system. Closed system means energy can be exchanged, the lid can go up and down, this work, or heat can escape or enter in here. Energy can be exchanged, but matter can't. And so the constant pressure closed system, and then this rigid container here would be a constant volume closed system. Whereas an isolated system is thermally insulated, so not only can it not exchange matter, it cannot exchange energy either. And so that would be an isolated system. So in an isolated system, if you put hot coffee in here, it would never get cold. It would never get cold because heat can't leak out in the surroundings. That's an ideal, you know. A um, little bit of heat's going to leak out, unfortunately. Okay, so there are two types of closed systems, constant volume and constant pressure. What do you think? True, yeah. All right, for objects, Q is A, amount times C times delta T. B, amount times delta H or amount times delta U, C, both A and B. Anybody else? A is correct. What's B? Yeah. Um, B is also Q. Q is equal to the amount times delta H, or Q is equal to the amount times delta U. So B is also Q, but it's Q for not objects, it's Q for reactions and processes. 
All are cute, though. Um, the difference is here, A uh, is just for heating and cooling of an object, so we have a delta T. But over here, there's no delta T. It's just energy being consumed or energy being released from the process or reaction. Constant temperature. All right, that's 31. 32, a mid-sized vehicle has over 3,000 liters of interior volume. This is a strategy for multiple choice. So we have 3,000 liters of interior volume. How many moles of air is in 3,000 liters? So one of the things um, that happened on this exam is somebody came up to me and uh, asked, you know, they can't solve this problem because they don't have, well, if you need moles and you have volume, you also need temperature and pressure. So they said they couldn't solve this problem because there's no temperature and pressure given. Okay. Um, but when you look at the answer, you know, the answers are so far off from one another that, you know, we don't have to do an exact calculation for this. We can just ballpark estimate it. And so, uh, one mole of gas is approximately how many liters? 25 liters. And then 3,000 divided by 25? Yeah, and so D. Thirty-three. A car interior containing thirty-six hundred grams of air at forty degrees C needs to be cooled to twenty-five degrees C. The specific heat of air in this range is one point oh oh five joules per gram degree C. The heat Q of the air is equal to what? Well, one thing is um, we're going from forty to twenty-five, so the air has to lose heat or gain heat in order to cool down. And you want to lose heat or gain heat? Lose heat. And so B can't be true. Because B is positive, that's gaining heat. So it's either A or C or none. So which one is it? Well, this is cooling air. Air is an object. And so we're just going to cool an object. You now, objects, all they can do is heat up or cool down. Reaction to processes, we don't change the temperature there. And so we have um, a car interior, 3,600 grams, so it's the amount, 3,600 times C, which is about 1, times delta T. Delta T is final temperature, 25 minus initial temperature, 40, which is going to be 15, Mi uh, minus 15 degrees. Minus 15 times 1 is about minus 15, minus 15 times 3,600 what? Fifty-four thousand joules, which is going to be fifty-four kilojoules. So it's negative fifty-four kilojoules. We have to lose this much energy to cool the air down inside a vehicle. And so that fifty-four kilojoules has to go somewhere, somewhere else. Thirty-four bomb calorimeters maintain constant pressure. That's false. Bomb calorimeters maintain constant volume. What calorimeter maintains constant pressure? Coffee cup calorimeter. It doesn't have to be. Coffee cup calorimeters don't have to be made out of coffee cups. They just have to be insulated containers. They have to be insulated containers so we don't lose too much heat out of the container into the um, lab. Your book, your book makes an assumption that the coffee cups are perfect insulators, and um, they absorb no heat. They lose no heat, and so the coffee cups. If you pour hot coffee in a coffee cup, it never cools down. 
in the coffee cups, your book assumes a zero heat capacity. That is, it takes zero joules of energy to warm up a coffee cup or cool it down. And um, they ignore it. However, we shouldn't ignore it because we're going to lose. If you put hot coffee in a coffee cup, eventually it's going to cool down. And therefore, it's losing heat to the coffee cup or the calorimeter, we call it. How many types of calorimeters are there? Am I missing any? Just two, right? Just two. One we call constant. One calorimeter we call constant volume. And the coffee cup ones are called constant pressure. Thirty-five. Fifty point zero milliliters of hot water at seventy-five point zero degrees C is in a cup. To this, fifty point zero milliliters of room temperature water was is added. And the final temperature is fifty-two point two degrees C. What is the heat capacity of the cup? So, if the heat capacity of the cup were zero then that means no heat is lost to the cup or the cup doesn't doesn't lose heat actually the cup is going to be warm sorry the cup is not going to lose heat and so um think about this if you put 50 milliliters of hot water and 50 milliliters of cold water then you're going to get you know this 100 milliliters mixture at what temperature will it be yeah it's going to be in the midway point, halfway between the hot and the cold temperature. So room temperature is 25. So halfway between 25 and 75 is 50. So if no heat were lost to the cup, or not, in this case, sorry, if the cup doesn't lose any heat, then only the hot water loses heat to the cold water, and the temperature should meet right in the middle. But when we look at this, what happens? The temperature doesn't meet right in the middle. And so the cup does lose some heat. So in other words, um, when we set this up, we can set it up like this. So I have a cup here, and I have hot water in here. Now, the coffee cup is in thermal contact. And so the cup itself is also going to be at 75.0 degrees C. The inside of the cup, you know, the outside is going to feel cool to the touch. So we want to know how much heat leaks out of the cup into the cold water here. And so we're going to pour in 50 milliliters of cold water in here. at 25 degrees C. And so we're going to cool down the hot water and we're going to cool down the cup. In fact, this looks very familiar. This looks like what? This looks exa this is the exact same problem as the lab, isn't it? It is the exact same problem. Okay, so what we're going to do is, um, there's going to be heat exchange. The hot water and the cup will lose heat, and the cold water will gain it. Now, the book ignores the heat from the cup, because it's assuming the cup has zero heat capacity. But we're not going to do that. Um, we're going to factor in the cup. And so which one do you want to call the system? Which one do you want to call the surroundings? In calorimetry, this is simply what we do. Q of the system is equal to minus Q of the surroundings. And so we have a label one as the system and the other as the surrounding. I 
I like to include the rest of the universe in the surroundings. So my preference is to include the um, hot water and the cup in the surroundings, because it's not just the cup. You know, you have the air here in the table the cup's on, and uh, whatever, whatever else. And so I'm going to call this the surroundings here. which would be the cup and the water. And then I'm going to call this the system here. And so my system is going to warm up. My surroundings will cool down. And so Q of the um, cold water is the system. And that's going to equal minus Q of the surroundings. Now, the surroundings are going to consist of two things. The first thing it's going to consist of is the hot water. And the second thing it consists of is the cup. So the heat absorbed by the cold water will be heat lost by the hot water and heat lost by the cup. Again, your book assumes that there's no heat gained or lost by the cup. It's a perfect insulator. But that's not reality. Is there such thing as a perfect insulator? I mean, no matter what container you put hot tea or hot coffee in, eventually it's going to cool down. You know, I have those vacuum mugs. It, I mean, it's, it stays warm or warm a lot longer, but still eventually it cools down. Uh huh. But does it matter which you choose as the system? Like, couldn't I say the, the hot water? Is the system, and then everything else is the surroundings, or the hot water and the cup is the system. Okay, you'd have to, you, whatever is in thermal contact with the hot water has to be part of the system. So you can say the system is the hot water and the cup, but you couldn't say the hot, or the hot water is the system, and the cup and the cold water are the surroundings, because the cup and the cold water are different temperatures. They have to be at the same temperature. But it doesn't matter which one you call the system and surroundings. I could, yeah, you're right. You could call this one the surroundings and this the system. It doesn't make any difference. You know, in fact, we could get rid of system and surroundings entirely and just figure out the heat exchange. You know, heat exchange is the hot objects are going to lose heat, connect energy to the cold. So the surroundings, where do we draw the line? Because, you know, when we do it, we talked about how it's really everything, you know, the whole universe, and then we just sum it up to the cubic calorimeter. Right. And so the cup is ignoring everything else. You know, in addition to the cup, we have air. But the thing is, the cup is not really a cup, because this is already in the room, and let's take this in a vacuum. Right. And so that heat there, the temperature there is, is this cup is not really a cup alone. The cup is really the calorimeter in this case, because the cup is going to have air in contact with it up here, and then heat's going to leak out from the cup here and here. And so, um, in reality, the cup is uh, the surroundings. And so I write cup here, but really, the whole surroundings is warm. I mean, this cup is open, so Sometimes you can feel the heat from some distance away from the cup. And so that cup is really the calorimeter. And so when we say Q of the cup, Q of the cup consists of the cup itself plus the air plus the table and everything else in the universe. Since the surroundings usually contains everything else in the universe, then that's the reason why I called this the system and I called this the surroundings. Because we like to put the surroundings with the rest of the universe. And so this Q of the cup is really the Q of the calorimeter. It contains everything because in this experiment, you know, we're looking at um, heat exchange.
All right, the next thing is we have different equations for Q. Q is either equal to the amount times C times D delta T, or Q is equal to the amount times delta H, or the amount times delta U. In this case, for the um, cold water, which one do we use? Do we use the object, or do we use the reaction process? Object. <laughs> The cold water is going to warm. So the cold water is going to be the amount of cold water times C times delta T for the cold water. And so the amount, um, how, how much cold water do we have? 50, um, 50 milliliters is how many grams? Yeah, so we'll just say 50 grams. Do you know what C is for water? Uh, we'll just go with three six figs. 4.18 joules per gram degree C. And then delta T. Delta T is T final minus T initial. T final is what? 52.2. And T initial for the cold water? Yeah. So this is my Q, the cold. Okay, what is Q for the hot water? Well, it's the amount of hot water. How much hot water do I have? Again, it's an object. Hot water is cooling down. 50.0 grams. C is the same, 4.18 joules per gram degrees C. And delta T is what? T final is 52.2 degrees C minus T initial, 75.0 degrees C. And so um, the hot water is an object, and this is equal to the amount times C times delta T. So this is Q for hot. All right, plus or minus Q of the cup. How many cups do I have? How many grams is that? Um, do we need to know how many grams it is? No. And so what we're just going to say is one cup times C. We don't know what the C of the cup is times delta T. We do know what delta T of the cup is. Because delta T, um, the cup is going to end up at 52.2 degrees C. But what was the initial temperature of the cup? Yeah, 75. The cup was in contact with the hot water. So this is 75.0 degrees C. So can somebody calculate? What are we missing here? We're missing the heat capacity of the cup. In other words, we're missing the heat capacity of the calorimeter. And so we're trying to figure out how much heat the cup loses per joule degree C. That's what the, or how much heat does it take to warm up for every um, gram degree C? Positive or negative? Anybody else? Yeah. This is right. This cup is like a coffee mug. It's not very well insulated. So this is the exact same calculation as you did for um, part one of experiment two. Would your heat capacity 
for the calorimeter to be higher or lower? This is like a ceramic coffee mug. It would be lower. That's correct. So the typical for if you if you have um, styrofoam cups that are and you have the lid on there and it's tightly sealed, you're looking at um, heat capacities of around 10, <coughs> 10 joules per degree C. 10 joules per degree C means it doesn't absorb that much heat. You know, in other words, you don't lose that much. 10 joules for every degree C. Whereas this one is losing like four times as much heat than your sealed coffee cups. You know, your coffee cups, it depends on how tightly sealed it is. It could be like 10, maybe 20 joules per degree C. Now, the book says that 10 or 20 joules is small. Ignore. But we really shouldn't ignore it. That's a little bit of heat that's been lost. You know, or gain or whatever, whichever way you're going. Now, if it comes out negative, then there's something seriously wrong. You know, if you put a hot cup of um, tea or coffee into a mug or something, it's going to get cold over time. You know, and the higher the heat capacity, the more heat is leaking out of that. And the more rapidly expected to cool down. If it were perfectly insulated, then it would be zero joules per degree C. This is no heat absorption or um, you know, heat transport or something that's perfectly insulated. But if it's negative, now that's a totally different thing. What if you got a negative heat capacity? Sometimes people do this experiment and they get negative heat capacities. We used to do this. Um, the procedure used to be pour the hot water into the cold. But when people poured the hot water into the cold, they always ended up with negative heat capacity. You know what negative heat capacity means? That means if you pour a hot cup of coffee into the cup, it's going to get hotter and hotter over time. That's what it means. Because, you know, the, the cup will lose heat to the coffee. In this case, the cup will absorb heat from the coffee. And so, that's it. The reason they were getting negative um, is because, you know, when they poured the hot water into the cold, you know what happened as they were pouring the liquid through the air? I'm sorry? Um, well, it... Well, when they poured the hot water into the cold, they had to pour it through room temperature air, and the air absorbed some of the heat. And so by the time the hot water hit the surface of the cold water, it was actually quite a bit colder. The air, air cooling um, is a phenomenon. Air is, you know, air is not the best coolant, but old Volkswagens had air-cooled air, air engines and... Um, so, could you do number 36? You know, 36 is a very similar problem, but, you know, there's some key differences between 36 and 35. You know, what are the key differences? These are things you, you mentally make note of or you write it down, you know. And 35 is object and object, uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, one, um, the system's a reaction. The system's a reaction, chemical reaction, you know, acid base neutralization. The surroundings will be objects. If you look at this coffee cup calorimeter, look at the heat capacity, 10.3 joules. So this is a lot better insulated than that coffee. So why don't you give this one a, a try? Um, actually, uh, at home we'll do that. I, I gotta continue on because I gotta catch up. But that's that. And then I posted another one today. I don't know if you saw it.
Yeah, but it's on Canvas. It's old exam three. So take a look at the multiple choice questions here. Free response question. Actually, let's uh, ignore this one and how this task. Should only be two pages long. All right, what I need to do is I need to continue on with chapter eight. So let me, uh, let me do that. And then you guys take a look at this when you go with questions. Have you seen those ultra black objects? I guess they are not called ultra black. Called other things. Benta black. That's it. It's hard to um. It's hard to see, right? Benta black object. I think that's pretty hard to see. It turns out that um, there's an article that came out, and there's a fish. There's a fish that's like that too. It has the um, the blackest skin ever found, and it absorbs a tremendous amount of light. You know, black objects absorb what colors of light? White, all of them. All of them, yeah. Absorbs all all colors. In fact, um, black objects are known as black bodies because they absorb all colors of light. And um, if you excite some black bodies, like this fish, you can't really excite. You know, because if you start to excite it, let's say heat it up, um, you'll probably end up cooking the fish. But um, but other objects, black body objects, if you start heating them up, then they start emitting light. And black body should emit what color is light. Black body should emit all colors of light. And so those are called black body radiators. And so um, hydrogen... Atomic hydrogen was atomic hydrogen gas was expected to be a black body emitter, but it wasn't. A black body emitter is going to emit a continuum of colors because there's a continuum of energies that are allowed. But in the hydrogen atom, we don't have a continuum. What do we call it? It's not a continuum. It's a well, it's all, both of them are spectrum, so we can have a continuous spectrum, or we could have a discontinuous spectrum. And discontinuous spectrum is often called a quantized yeah. spectrum. In a quantized spectrum, um, only certain energies are allowed. All the other energies are forbidden. And so the picture um, for this, well... That's the first thing. Um, so classical physics predicted black body radiation from hydrogen atoms, but they didn't get black body radiation. They, ex they expected nice white light, all the colors of the rainbow. Not only that, there was a catastrophe. Do you guys recall the catastrophe? What was the catastrophe? It was a catastrophe for classical physics, because classical physics predicted 
not only will we see visible, we saw we see infrared visible, and then what's after visible? Ultraviolet. Uh, we expected um, significant ultraviolet radiation, that is, light coming from a black body, but what was observed is a dramatic drop-off in the ultraviolet. They called that the UV catastrophe. So physics up to this point um, predicted continua, a continuum of energy. It totally makes sense of continuum of energy. Because um, a hydrogen atom just consists of a proton and an electron. And you think that electron can have any energy, that is, it can move any speed it wants. But it can't. So um, the first um, energy that's allowed, we call, um, or first orbit, we'll just call this an orbit. And we're going to call it R1. So this is the first allowed orbit, R1. And there's a mathematical pattern to this. So R1 is equal to n squared, or I should say Rn. Rn is equal to n squared times, their book calls it A0. And so R1 is equal to 1 squared times A0. A0 is 0.54 angstroms. And so physics, you know, based on the energies that are allowed, predicted that the electron is orbiting at a rate, radius of 0.54 angstroms. And um, this model that we're talking about is the Bohr model. Or Bohr theory. A theory should do two things. What should a theory do? Should be able to predict. Yeah, it should be able to predict new unforeseen results and it should be well accepted. Well accepted. And so I guess a Bohr model of theory was well accepted. Because it was able to predict the next orbit. The next orbit is um, R2. And that's going to be 2 squared times A0. And so the first radius here is 0.54 angstroms. The next radius is going to be what? Four times 0.54, so be like 2.16 or something. Yeah, 2.16 angstroms. Or in other words, four a naught. A naught's the original, or R1. I call it R1. It's one. It doesn't matter what you call it. But people have different symbols for it. And so, um, yeah, 1.16 angstroms. Or 2.16 angstroms. Okay, the next radius is going to be R3, which is going to equal how many times A naught? 3 squared times A naught, which is going to be 9. So about 4.5, more than 4.5. About 4.8, etc. The next one is going to be what? R4. And R4 will be how many times? 16. Now, in the Bohr model, these are allowed. And so the electrons can have these energies. However, anything in between is forbidden. So the electrons.
electron cannot occupy any orbits lower than 0 0.54 angstrom, so this is forbidden. And the electron cannot occupy anything from 0.54 to 2.16. So an orbit of one angstrom is forbidden. Why is that? Why is an orbit of 0.54 angstroms allowed, but an orbit of one angstrom is forbidden? A theory would be nice, it would be nice to have a fundamental picture of what's going on, but in, in this particular theory, um, there's no fundamental picture. Why the orbit of one angstrom doesn't exist is because it doesn't exist. If it did exist, we'd get another allowed line in the line spectrum. And so, um, so um, that's what we call a postulate of quantum mechanics. A postulate of quantum mechanics is just something that's taken without proof. You know, the proof is, is that um, it's not observed. If it's not observed, then it doesn't exist. That's the proof. It turns out that the orbits, which um, are going to have an end value, and the first orbit, the second orbit, the third orbit, these are all allowed, all the way to, you know what the largest orbit that's allowed? Infinity. And so way out here, this n equals infinity, we call r sub infinity. r sub infinity is going to be infinity squared times a naught. So we're infinity squared angstroms away. And so how many allowed orbits are there? Infinite. There's an infinite number of allowed orbits. Well, if there's an infinite number of allowed orbits, doesn't that mean that all orbits are allowed? Yeah. It turns out, no, it doesn't mean. Because there are going to be how many forbidden orbits? An infinite number of forbidden. So there's an infinite number of allowed and an infinite number of forbidden. In fact, there's more forbidden than allowed. Because what about 0.55 forbidden, 0.56 forbidden, 0.57 forbidden? Everything in between these two orbits is forbidden. And everything between these two orbits is forbidden. Etc. So this um, Bohr model is the first quantum model. This is the simple quantum model. But um, some parts of the Bohr model were tamed. Some parts aren't. Because uh, it turns out that one of the most important things a theory should do is it should be able to make predictions. But the problem with the Bohr model was it could make some predictions, but it couldn't make most predictions. And that was a problem. But one of the things that was retained is the idea of quantized energy. And when we do the physics of this, we can come up with something called an energy level diagram, which you just plot energy on the y. And we come up with E1. E1 is the first allowed energy. So we can use some physics and figure this out here and come up with an equation for this here. And the equation for the energy is E n is equal to minus r sub h over n squared. This is where r sub h is a constant. r sub h is equal to 2.179 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. So E1 here is equal to minus, actually, yeah, minus 2.179 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. The 
divide by n squared. n squared is 1. And so the lowest energy the electron can occupy is negative 2.179 times 10 minus 18 joules, which corresponds to this first orbit here. The next allowed energy is called E2. E2 is going to be um, minus 2.179 times 10 to the minus 18 joules divided by 2 squared. And so it'll be one quarter of this. Of this energy. And then we have E3, which is going to equal minus R sub H over 9. E4, which is equal to minus R sub H over 16, etc. And unlike the orbits, you can see the orbits diverge. The orbits diverge out to infinity. However, the energies converge. And the highest energy we're going to have is E infinity. E infinity is equal to minus R sub H over infinity squared. And so whenever you divide something by infinity, or infinity squared in this case, what does it approach? Zero. And so um, this is going to equal zero. So the highest energy we can have is zero joule. The lowest energy we can have is minus 2.179 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. So the energy scale is weird in this energy level diagram. And so let me talk about that briefly here. If I take an electron and promote it to the highest energy orbit, it would be more, it would be <coughs> squared angstroms away. And so the electron would be infinitely far from the nucleus. When the electron's infinitely far from the nucleus, then there's no interaction between the electron and the nucleus. And so let's start there. That's what we call zero energy. Now, is that literally zero energy? No. It's just, this is all relative energy in this case. So we put the electron infinitely far away from the nucleus, and it's at zero joules of energy. Now, that doesn't mean the electron has zero energy. The electron is going to have some energy. In fact, when we look at the internal energy of electrons, it's chemical, I mean, not chemical, but it's potential energy and um, kinetic energy. It should be the sum. But relative to the hydrogen atom, this electron would be at zero, and this is the way we do it. What we do is we bring it closer, this is the point. we bring it closer and closer to the nucleus. As the electron gets closer to the nucleus, there's a positive and negative coulombic attraction. And so due to this attraction, the energy is lowered until, how close, what's the closest we can get to the nucleus? The closest we can get to the nucleus is... 0.54 angstroms away. Once we get to 0.54 angstroms, that's as low as it can get because it can't get any closer. If we could get closer, then it'd be going even lower. And in fact, this is not a continuous range of ener energies here. This is a quantized range that is discontinuous. But I'm not showing it. No. And so the lowest energy here is minus. 2.179 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. The highest energy here is zero joules. And so this is why it's weird. This is why it's negative. It's negative because we're, we're arbitrarily defining zero as an electron infinitely far away from the nucleus. And it's not interacting with the nucleus at all. And so it's an arbitrary zero. It doesn't really have zero energy. The electron's moving. It's got kinetic energy. There could be potential energy if there are any um, positive objects or negative objects around. All right, so how much, if an electron is down here on the first floor, how much energy does it cost to bring it all the way to the top floor? The highest floor is E infinity. But E infinity is not infinitely far away in terms of energy. 
E infinity is only how far away in terms of energy? Yeah, in, in terms of energy, we can promote the electron from the bottom floor here to the top floor here if we give it how much, how many joules worth of energy? 2.179 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. If we input 2.179 times 10 to the negative 18 joules to this electron, it's going to get promoted to the top here. Well, 2.179 times 10 to the minus 18 joules is a finite amount of energy, but in terms of radius, it's infinitely. And we call that the ionization energy of hydrogen. Ionization energy is often abbreviated as IE. The ionization energy is 2.179 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. That's how much energy it's going to cost to take it from the lowest energy here to the highest energy up here. This would be the ionization energy. From the lowest energy here to the highest energy here. What kind of photon has that energy? 2.179 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. We can figure it out, but I want to do it a different way this time. Last time we had the photon energy and we figured out the wavelength of light. That would do it. In this case, um, this ionization energy is a little weird. The ionization energy is in weird units. So the ionization energy of hydrogen is equal to 2.179 times 10 to the minus 18 joules per what? Per hydrogen atom. So if I have a single hydrogen atom, I need to input 2.179 times 10 to the minus 18 joules worth of energy to promote the electron. The highest energy level would be the ionization These aren't common units that everybody's used to. A much more common unit is kilojoules per mole. You know, when we're dealing with ionization energies, people are thinking kilojoules per mole. So how can I go from joules per hydrogen atom to kilojoules per mole of hydrogen atoms? Well, it turns out it's pretty easy. If I want to convert this to kilojoules per mole, I'll just <coughs> multiply by Avogadro's number. 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd hydrogen atom per mole of hydrogen atoms. And so what does that give us? Is that what you guys got? Yeah, okay. 1,312 kilojoules per mole. So what kind of light is that? And so this is a different approach. Last time we were looking at wavelengths, we could do the same exact approach for this particular problem. But for this particular problem, I want to do it a little bit differently. So what color photon do I have to shine at this? Red? <coughs> is that enough? Orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet? Ultraviolet, X-ray, infrared. And so there are different ways of visualizing visual, I mean, uh, visible light. One way of looking at light is in terms of wavelength. 
Um, visible light varies from what wavelength to what wavelength. Is it 380 to 760? Actually, let me let me write it backwards. Uh, I'm going to go 390 to 760. Or, um, actually, let me write it backwards. I'm going to go from 760 to 390. What color light is 760 nanometer? Red and three ninety. So wavelengths shorter than three ninety should be in ultraviolet, and wavelengths longer than seven sixty should be in the infrared. And so, what we want to do here is we want to know. You know, last time we looked at um, how much energy per photon that is. Remember, um, last time we calculated the energy of the photon. The energy of the photon is equal to, what is that equal to? This is a very famous equation. It's equal to H times nu. What's nu? Frequency. We don't typically memorize the frequency, but there's a relationship between frequency and wavelength. So we can end up with this equation, hc over lambda. So if we do this, then the red light is going to be um, H. H is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times second. C. C is 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. These you don't have to memorize. Those will be given. Over lambda. Lambda should be in meters. So what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert it to meters. A nano is times 10 to the minus 9, so 760 nanometers will be 760 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. And what do we get? This is red right at the edge of red. This is going to be um, joules per red photon of 700. This is for one photon. This is a unit, but that's not the most common unit. The most common unit is kilojoules per mole. So what does this equal in terms of energy in kilojoules per mole? Joules. 
Exponents off. Negative nineteen, yeah. Okay, does it come out now? Yeah, okay, okay. So is a red photon enough to ionize hydrogen? Well, in order to ionize hydrogen, we need 1,312 kilojoules per mole. A red photon's energy is only 157.4 kilojoules per mole. Is it enough energy? No. So red will not ionize hydrogen. Let's try violet. The highest energy violet we have is at 390. So can you repeat these calculations for violet and tell me how many kilojoules of energy violet light has per mole? So try that calculation. Let's see what we end up with. 